Omar Al-Asai born June 4, 1967, is a Lebanese human rights activist and previously a journalist, director, producer, and television personality. Between 1994 and 1996, Al-Asai was a reporter with the BBC Arabic World Service Television. On August 9, 1995, he was shot and wounded while on assignment for the BBC. The incident took during the Bosnian War. In 1996, he was one of the original staff recruited for the launch of Al Jazeera TV. In June 2011, Al Isai ended his 15 year association with Al Jazeera. He subsequently joined Human Rights Watch as Director of Advocacy and Communications for the Middle East and North Africa region. Omar al Isai was the subject of an extensive article in the New Yorker magazine in April 2003. He was also featured in New York magazine, Newsweek as well as The Nation. al Isai has been an occasional analyst for Al Jazeera's English language channel, commenting on Lebanese affairs, and has contributed to its website. In 2009 The Guardian newspaper named Omar al Isai as a living national icon of Lebanon. Omar al Isawi متولد 4 جون 1967 یکی از فعالان حقوق بشر لبنان می باشد. او روزنامه نگار، کارگردان و تهیه کننده و از شخصیت های تلویزیونی است. بین سالهای 1994 و 96 گزارشگر تلویزیون عربی با سرویس خبری بی بی سی فعالیت داشته است. در تاریخ 9 آگوست 1995 در حالی که برای بی بی سی در طول جنگ بوسنی گزارش تهیه می کرد به ضرب گلوله مجروح شد. او یکی از کارکنان اصلی برای راه اندازی شبکه تلویزیون الجزیره در سال 1996 بوده است. الیساوی بعد از 15 سال فعالیت خود را با تلویزیون الجزیره به پایان رساند و بعد از آن در دیدبان حقوق بشر به عنوان مدیر و ارتباطات برای خاور میانه و شمال آفریقا به فعالیت پرداخت. او به عنوان تحریرگر در امور لبنان گاه به گاه برای کانال انگلیسی زبان الجزیره اظهار نظر می کرد و بالاخره از طرف روزنامه گاردین علیساوی در سال 2009 به عنوان نماد زندگی ملی لبنان لقب گرفت. علیساوی امروز مهمان برنامه پیپل پاور بود. بینندگان عزیز تلویزیون ملی ایران مهمان امروز ما همونطور که قبلا معرفی کردیم و به آیگروفیشون رو گفتیم آقای عمر ال ایساوی هستن که ایشون فعال حقوق بشر در سوریه خواهند بود و در همونطوری که در بایگرافی گفتیم از سال در 15 سال در تلویزیون الجزیره کار کردن و بعد در بی بی سی عربی در سالهای 94 تا 96 به عنوان تهیه کننده کار میکردن و در آگست 95 همونطور که افته شد در جنگ های بوسنیا تیر خوردن اجزه بدید که با ایشو مصاحبه رو شروع کنیم مصر ایساوی thank you very much that you you accept our uh, invitation and we are very happy to have you here we are going to talk about the Middle East and especially Syria today about these things that happen. And everybody is worrying what's going to happen in Middle East. And I hope that your idea, your information will help the, our viewers. Thank you very much for having me on the program. Uh, obviously the Middle East since the beginning of the Arab, Spr Arab Spring towards the end of last year in Tunisia has uh, attracted a lot of attention uh, in the world. We have seen uh, the people of Egypt and Tunisia uh, successfully depose their presidents in the first uh, mass popular uprising of its kind in uh, modern history in the Arab world, and I don't say uh, the Middle East in general. Um, we find uh, some disturbing uh, events taking place in countries like uh, Syria and Libya, for example, uh, where the human rights violations ha are extremely serious, um, extremely disturbing. 
and unacceptable from our viewpoint. And that is where we have been concentrating our uh, efforts, advocacy efforts, uh, uh, for the past uh, several months. But this does not mean that we have not been paying attention to what's happening elsewhere in the region. For example, uh, we follow the situation in Bahrain very closely, in Egypt, uh, in Tunisia, and elsewhere in the region. And of course, we cannot uh, exclude uh, Iran, uh, where we have a dedicated Bahra Bahrain and uh, Iran researcher. Uh because you know we want to know more about you can you because you know i know that you tell us about a bit of a bit about yourself i understand you worked for al jazeera for 15 years and recently joined the human rights watch can you tell us about what happens how long do you work with al jazeera then bbc and uh, i heard that you got the uh, uh, you got shot in bosnia can you just yeah. shortly tell what's your back on what how what happened Yes, I indeed I am a journalist uh, by profession. I started uh, my career in journalism over 21 years ago. Um, uh, I, the, I went to the BBC in '94 and worked for the BBC for a couple of years, which is when there was a group of us, four of us, uh, covering the events in the Bosnian War. We were uh, shot at. Uh, unfortunately, one of our colleagues was killed in that incident, uh, John Schofield, he used to work also for um, ITN. And after that, I joined uh, Al Jazeera. I was one of the founding staff of Al Jazeera. So I was there from 96, 1996 until um, late June of this year. And then I took up my current position, which is Director of Advocacy and Communications with Human Rights Watch uh, for the Middle East and North Africa Division. So that, in a nutshell, very briefly, is a little bit about me. Okay, before we start to talk about the Syria, please explain to our viewers the importance of the evidence-based research in repair reporting. There are many stories in articles, blogs, social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, but Human Rights Watch is a research and repairing, reporting organization. What is the difference between empirical research and sharing information online? We at Human Rights Watch cannot accept any report or any call that we get or any video that is presented to us as the truth. We cannot work that way. We have to verify every single piece of information before we, on our end, uh, are comfortable enough with it and, and confident enough with it in order for us to use that as part of our uh, news releases or reports. Therefore, uh, in a country like Syria, for example, um, while we have been prevented from working in Syria, uh, although I would like to point out that we did have a team unofficially uh, undeclared to the government working uh, in Syria for a while, a few months ago. Uh, at the same time, we have our researchers who are in the bordering countries, that is uh, in Turkey, in Jordan, and in Lebanon, who are always around either at the border or receiving direct information and corroborating and verifying that information. And therefore, uh, for example, if somebody says, well, here, this is a video of the security forces shooting at demonstrators in the city of Dara, we cannot accept at face value that this is in the city of Dara. We will have to find, and this is what we do, we go out and we find corroborating information and other sources and other witnesses to the same event, to the scene, until we build the whole story. Which is, in a way, I think, what journalists do also when, well, good journalists are supposed to do, when they say that you cannot run a story with just one source. Because that way, if, if, if you do not have these precautions, precautions and use these standards, you are leaving yourself up, uh, open to um, all kinds of maybe attack uh, in terms of uh, our uh, credibility, and uh, we cannot accept that. And therefore, we have a very strict set of standards on how we operate. We have heard that the thousands of Syria have been murdered, 20,000 have been imprisoned, and 30,000 have gone into hiding or into exile this year. 
Is this close to the number of that Human Rights Watch have been able to empirically uh, gather this uh, information? Is it true? We are confident enough to say that at least or around 2,000 Syrians have been killed since the beginning of this uprising almost five months ago. That there are uh, between 10,000 to 12,000 detainees, people that the security forces uh, have detained. Of course, this is a fluid situation and um, uh, the repression, the crackdown and the violations of human rights continue. So these numbers are always increasing on an almost daily basis. So these are the numbers that we have. In June, Human Rights Watch called atrocities in Dara, crimes against the humanity, and produced a report called, we have never seen such a hero. What is uh, this report and how did you, organization, come to the determine these crimes? Yes, you're uh, talking about a report that was essentially put together by the director of our Beirut office, uh, Nadim Huri, who is in close contact with uh, the Syrian situation on a daily basis. And of course, um, what happens in, in these kinds of situations is that people at the time were just flocking out of Syria, seeking refuge elsewhere, out of Dara specifically, um, because uh, Dara uh, was where it all started. And that is where the regime uh, concentrated its uh, crackdown in the beginning. It went to try to snuff out uh, what was happening in Dara, this, these overwhelmingly uh, peaceful demonstrations. When people were streaming out of the border, going to Lebanon and going to Jordan and going to Turkey, we were able to gather a whole lot of evidence that gave us the confidence to come out with this statement, as you just said, crimes against humanity or description of crimes against humanity. These were the, the result of direct eyewitness reports to our researchers on the ground. And uh, these are not just from the protesters. We also have army defectors mm -hmm. told us that they were instructed, ordered to fire on civilians. And many of these soldiers decided to disobey and fled, and we managed to interview some of them too. Mr. Yusavi, earlier this month, at the beginning of the Ramadan, and there was a massacre against the Syrian people. Some say over 200 were murdered. Please uh, tell us about this attack. Why in Ramadan? I think you are referring, uh, referring to the city of Hama. It's yes. important to give the historical background of Hama. Hama was the scene of a rebellion against President uh, Hafez al-Assad in 1982 that was very brutally put down by the, by the Syrian government back then. The estimates, and they are just estimates, they are, are anywhere from 10,000 to 30, even up to 40,000 people killed in the city of Hama. And this is just the number of people who were killed wow. back then. So Hama really is an open sore in Syria. Even today, um, or maybe a few months ago, before, before the uprising began in Syria, people would only whisper about the events, what they called the events of Hama, the Hama massacre, what is really a Hama massacre. And none of the perpetrators were brought to justice. And therefore, uh, Hama had begun uh, agitating also against the Syrian government and the uh, uh, presidency of, of uh, Bashar al-Assad. And that is when the, this uh, crackdown started in Hama. Now, you ask the question, well, why in the month, the month of Ramadan? And that is a holy month when people are uh, supposed to fast from uh, dawn until sunset and uh, de dedicate themselves to spiritual matters rather than material matters? Well, that is a very good question, but that is a question that should be asked of the Syrian government and the Syrian security forces. Why did they feel compelled to enter yet another Syrian city with tanks, with their uh, security forces, and with the armed thugs? The problem is it's, that it's not just military forces or security forces in uniform. These 
forces and, and these troops are accompanied quite often with civilian gangs, thugs, that are called in Arabic Shabiha, yeah. uh, which is, uh, and, uh, and they also are also some of the ones who perpetrate a lot of these uh, really, truly horrific human rights violations that we have been seeing in Syria. So that specific incident you're, you're talking about uh, refers to uh, what is happening in Hama. Of course, after that, it went on to uh, Deir ez-Zor and other uh, Syrian cities and towns. And I think that's what the, the Syrian authorities do not understand is that no amount of repression or firepower um, or T-72 tanks or T-54 tanks or T-55 tanks can put down a people's desire uh, to regain their rights and dignity. After this horrible things that happened, UN Security Council condemned to Syria and the Assad. What is your opinion of how Syria respond to this to the UN? Well, <laughs> well um, it's quite obvious uh, the Syrians responded with uh, an even more brutal crackdown. That was their response, uh, which means that they do not recognize the authority of the United Nations Security Council, and uh, they will pay no attention. I mean, as a matter of fact, the uh, UN uh, Human Rights Council mandated a mission back in April to go to Syria to investigate the situation on the ground there. And that uh, team of the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, has still not been granted access to Syria uh, almost four months later. So that tells you how much uh, respect the Syrian government has shown uh, the Security Council and uh, the international community so far. In May, President Ahmadinejad made a statement, President of Iran, uh, a statement supporting Assad crackdown, declaring that the Syria government and the people of Syria have reached a level of the maturity of solved their own problem by themselves, and now, and not, there is no need for foreign intervention. So, what, what, what do you think about the doctor, uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad, and interfering Ahmadinejad with the Syria and uh, creating problem? What do you think about this idea that Mr. Ahmadinejad says that nobody can interfere in Syria? And uh, even the Iranian government that's doing the same thing to, uh, the, they're doing. They're killing the people that come into the street. What do you think about the Syrian or someone for uh, uh, to see this as an Iranian government interfering there? What do what you think about this uh, idea of Ahmadinejad said? Well, um, we at Human Rights Watch are not calling for any kind of foreign intervention in Syria. Let's be, be very, very clear about that. And um, so far, um, and I'm speaking personally here, I don't think that anybody uh, has seriously put forward uh, the uh, case for a, a military intervention in Syria. So let's get that out of the way. Now, the, the second thing is about Iran's position, and it's not just uh, President Ahmadinejad, but it was also Ayatollah Khamenei and uh, various other government uh, officials uh, who have declared their support for the Syrian authority in uh, what is transpiring now in Syria. The question that I, as a staff member of Human Rights Watch, would like to ask the authorities in Tehran is, how come they were so supportive of the uprisings of the people of Tunisia and Egypt? And they thought that that was an uprising against injustice, zulm. Yeah. But in Syria, it does not apply. Is it because the government in Tehran is uh, friendly, has friendly relations with Syria? I don't think that that should be the criteria for establishing whether a people's uprising should be supported or not. What is your sense of the Iranian position in Syria? More recently, have you been hearing similar statement by Ahmadinejad or others in the Iranian government? Why you think, uh, what's the benefit of Iran, uh, on, on your view, and why the Iran has to interfere in that, uh, or looking for what, uh, in Syria, in Libya, everywhere, and what you think, what's, what's the goal of the Iran in this uh, 
this situation that he stands for? Well, I think here we're going into the realm of politics, which uh, I would rather not enter uh, because uh, um, I would prefer to limit myself to uh, the realm of human human rights. But um, indeed, uh, I'm, uh, the Iranian government would be well advised, for example, to uh, allow access to the uh, UN uh, human rights uh, rapporteur, who has still not been allowed access to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, why Iran is doing this, why it's supporting uh, the Syrian crackdown, of course, that is politics, and I'm sure that we are all aware of the regional uh, power play and the implications of politics in the region. That, in a nutshell, is what I can tell you. I understand that countries of the global south, of the South Africa, India, and Brazil, have not met comments regarding the, these atrocities, what kind of the statement could they make concerning Syria? What you think, why, why, why they didn't say, at the, up to now they didn't say, but what you think, well, as your human rights and something happening in Syria, killing the people, and uh, what they have to do, just they have to stay like that, or do you, you believe as a people or people for freedom, what these countries, why they didn't say anything, if, if you think they have to uh, say something, what you, what you request, what you expect that they say? Well, we believe that uh, South Africa, Brazil, and India are very influential countries. They are very important countries, and they are also non-permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Now, just under, three, uh, just under two weeks ago, a joint delegation of these countries went to Damascus and met the authorities over there. Uh, what we expect from countries is to join the international effort to put an end to these gross violations, these unacceptable violations of human rights that are taking place on a daily basis in Syria. We recognize that each of these countries has had a national struggle of its own to arrive at where it is today. India's struggle for independence is very well documented. Brazil had to endure a military junta until it finally came to democratic rule as it is today. Mm -hmm. And South Africa, of course, we all know uh, yeah. the struggle of uh, the great Nelson Mandela and the ANC in the face of apartheid. So we think that these countries have the background in order to recognize and support a people's aspiration for their dignity and respect for human rights, which is guaranteed by the UN Charter uh, and all human rights conventions. We believe that everybody should come on board and strongly condemn, strongly condemn what the Syrian authorities are doing and to get beyond that point also and start taking effective measures in order to get the message of the international community to the Syrian authorities loud and clear. Mr. Ali Sabi, the Arab League has also been quiet, as I see it, as a Kuwait, as a Qatar. How do you see them speaking out? Well, uh, the Arab position has begun to change a little bit over the past week or so. Um, we finally had a breaking of the Arab silence. Mm -hmm. Kuwait and Qatar came out uh, with a statement. Um, that expressed concern at what is happening in Syria. And that was followed, of course, by uh, the letter of King Abdullah of uh, Saudi Arabia to the Syrian authorities. And then the withdrawal of the Saudi ambassador uh, from Damascus and Bahrain's ambassador from Damascus and, and uh, Kuwait's ambassador from Damascus. The Arab League, we have just sent a letter out a few days ago to the Secretary General of the Arab League, Mr. Nabil al Arabi calling on him to forcefully intervene in this situation. We know that the Arab League can effectively intervene in such a situation because 
they did it in Libya. Libya was suspended from the Arab League because of the violence that was being perpetrated against Libyan civilians. We don't know why this is not happening in the case of Syria. Perhaps judgments are clouded by what transpired later on in Libya. But in Syria, you do not have an armed rebellion. You do not have an armed uprising. You do not have armed opposition forces. What we have in Syria are overwhelmingly civilian protests against the government over there that are being met with lethal force, with detentions, with torture, with extrajudicial killings, with a siege of cities and towns, cutting off their water and electricity supplies. And therefore, the Arabs must, they absolutely must go beyond concern expressing concern. What the Arabs must do is take a very clear position on Syria. And the Arabs can exert pressure, and they can be effective, as they have demonstrated before in the case of Libya. What is happening today in Libya should not in any way affect their efforts to stop this madness that is going on in Syria. What is happening in Syria is a crime against humanity, and the Arabs have an overwhelming responsibility to make it stop. We understand that uh, the Arab League has uh, talked before about uh, it being against foreign intervention. Well, I think that the best prevention, preventative measure to foreign intervention is for the Arab League to intervene urgently and directly in what's happening in Syria. Uh, I think the last word that you said is very important because you have to know it and we have to know it, all of us. The word is not something that you can say at the some, pre some place, some part of the planet. If create a problem for all the words, anything, directly or indirectly, if they cannot solve it, the neighbors and that field, international will come and we, they will interfere and for their, for their benefit. You know it, that's what happens. So I think so what you're saying is right. And the uh, only thing that I'm, I want to know, and uh, before I let you go, uh, what are happening really, uh, we are watching, and we know it because I am originally from Iran. We have a problem in that field with the human rights. And all the Middle East now is trying the people to get the human rights that they have to have, change in the 421st century, and they have a lot of problems. But my concern as an Iranian American, it is, now let's say the Syria, situation that Syria has, interfering that has Syria and the government and Iran through the Iran to the other neighbors like Lebanon or something. Uh, what do you think? Do you think that if uh, uh, Assad, Assad anyhow has to come down and will come because the people, they don't want it. And what they don't want him. So if it comes down, what kind of the government that can, can make the Middle East more secure and make the Middle East uh, less problem that we see as so much killing in the last 12, 15 years, what kind of the government do you think the people of Syria were going to choose? And uh, there is any danger that, because you know what we hear in, uh, and American, they said, is probably there's Al Qaeda group in there, as Hezbollah, Iranian government. What will be the for Iranian, for Syrian people to have a really independent government for people and by people? What you think there was a hope that after Assad will come someone that people they have the freedom and they can talk about what they can choose their government, and they don't go after. Uh, the people that they wanted bloodshed or killing on terrorist group or whatever. What do you think, what kind of the things do you think can create after Assad in uh, Syria? I cannot, of course, uh, talk on behalf of the Syrian people. Um, I will tell you what we at Human Rights Watch would like to see in the Middle East and North Africa region. What we would like to see, and this is in no way conflicting or contradictory with the teachings of Islam, which is the major 
religion in the region. What we would like to see is governments that respect the rights of their people, that take the voice of their people into account. In the end, human rights mean dignity. And human rights is not just about asking for your own or demanding your own human rights of freedom of expression or religion or whatever it may be. It is also about giving it to others. And that means those who are less privileged than oneself. For example, there is a migrant class of laborers, domestic workers, maids in the Middle East and North Africa region that need their human rights to be respected. We would very much like to see this take hold in all the Arab countries. I think it would be a great shame, both in the Arab countries and in the rest of the MENA region, and that includes Iran. It would be a great shame that after such a long struggle of protest, of activism, of the continuous demand for human rights to head in the opposite direction, to do unto others what was done unto you. That would be more than a, a shame, really. It would be a crime against the blood and the suffering and the sacrifice of all those who stood up for their rights and the rights of their citizens and their dignity. And we are still hopeful in countries like Egypt, for example, in countries like Tunisia, that have managed to change their president, to topple their president, we are still hopeful that that kind of activism that the whole world witnessed will lead the way to a brighter future. We are not uh, naive. We know that there are stumbling blocks. We know that there are obstacles. But uh, the path towards the evolution of societies has never been uh, uh, strewn with roses. It's going to be hard work, but we are relying on the conscience of the people of the Middle East and North Africa region to take it to where it should be and offer a brighter, better, more respectful future, full of dignity for all of its inhabitants. Mr. Omar al Isavi, appreciate it for your invitation that we had you accepted, and we hope that we talk to you. And all of us, we have to bring the voice of the people for freedom and democracy for all the peace on the world, and especially in Middle East that we need it. It's a very important country economically and everything, and it's time that we change, that we go for the future. And I appreciate it, and I hope that you and other people that work in, working and fi fighting for the freedom of the people, they get enough help and they will success, and all of the world will come to the peace. And we're trying to do the same thing. I appreciate it for your time. Hope to talk to you more. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. دوستان عزیز اجازه بدید که بریم و برگردیم و تلفن‌ها رو باز کنیم و با شما صحبت می‌کنیم. با ما باشید.